Well, welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to the September meeting. Is it September? Yes, it still is. Almost October. Well, welcome to our meeting um, for the Central Florida Writers and Publishers Guild. We're going to have a good time tonight. There's a lot of stuff going on out there in the world. You know, vaccines um, always dominating the news, rightly so. Um, then there's all this mess happening with Afghanistan and everywhere else. But tonight, we are going to forget all about that stuff for a little bit. And we're going to have a wonderful, wonderful informational time. Our, our first speaker, our first speaker tonight um, will be Dr. Angela Adams. And so at this time, I'm going to ask uh, Roger Caldwell to go ahead and interview her. This, this lady, um, I read her resume and it is just absolutely astounding. It is absolutely impressive. And um, I, I think you guys are definitely in for a treat tonight. So with that, um, Roger, if you'll go ahead and take it away. I, I, I'd like to introduce everybody and I'd like to uh, first say good evening to everyone on the call tonight. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Angela Adams. The, Dr. An Angela is a iconic his person who, who to me has done some great things in this community. And, and the things that she has done in this community are historic. I like to first start out by saying, I met Dr. Adams through my mother, who also was a doctor and, and the health department. And um, she told me that there was this sister that was doing these summits. And, I, and I, I, I couldn't believe that this is happening. But eventually when I went to the first one, the first thing you'll, you'll know about her, she says to everyone, there should be no barriers, no barriers. She always keeps telling me that, no barriers. So for 20 years, she had a Black Health Summit. And with that Health Summit, it was free. Everything was free. And, 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 it, and it was just phenomenal how many people would show up. I mean, she ended up with the whole convention center. I mean, it was certain parts of the entire convention. And, and it's just amazing. Um, the name of her company is the... Is the Central Florida Pharmacy Pharmacy Council, and she's the executive director. She's been in the Navy for 32 years now. Now she may, I may, I may be wrong, but I, somewhere around those 32 years. So I mean, she's just a phenomenal lady. Um, with her with her health summit, she for black men, she eventually also had a, a portion for young men. I think it was called Crossing Bridges. And and it was just phenomenal. She she you know, the first thing when we think of 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 this of this young of, of Dr. Adams, she has a deep love um for black people. I mean and and, and a special affinity for black men and, and education and, and, and so that we, and she believes that black men have to be, we have, we have to educate black men and teach them about the, the most, one of the serious issues that black men have to answer. So um, Dr. Adams, I like to tease her a little bit and say, Dr. Adams is back. And, and she has now, and her a big thing for her is education. So she has an African-American health resource directory that I'm sure she wants everyone to pick up it and we'll, and we'll tell everybody about that. She also has an educational side of her business where she's working with, which is called Medication Information Safety for Seniors, which she says calls that Miss. And she also has a research project that is too deep for me to even explain. So she'll talk a little bit, I'm sure, about that. And then she also will have Dr. Woods, a certified urologist tonight, a Black urologist. And he is her medical director of the Black Men's Health Summit. And, and some of the things he'll talk about is prostate cancer, what is prostate cancer, the risk factors, 
an early detector. So everyone, please give her a hand wherever you are. <laughs> the iconic and great <laughs> Dr. Angela Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Roger, for those kind words. And I'm so glad I'm drawing back from my, uh, yes, I was in the military Navy for uh, 32 years. And, you know, the motto is always be prepared because you told me that we were going to come on second. And uh, I was all ready for that. But, I, you know, my... Uh, my, my other commander, Dr. Woods, he was Navy too, so I see he's on, so he is ready. So, you know, we got that from my Navy, from our military training, always be prepared. Well, I want to thank you for those kind, kind words. You know, I'm a real modest person, um, but prostate cancer is personal to me. Um, it started, my journey started with my mom and I, we lost a dear friend to prostate cancer. And that journey started more than 25 years. And after his death, we made a commitment to tell anybody that would listen about prostate cancer in hopes that we would prevent them or a loved one from dying prematurely from prostate cancer. Prostate cancer is the second most common cancer in men. And this year, the American Cancer Society estimates that more than 248,000 men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. And approximately 30,000 of them will be African-American men. Prostate cancer is the uh, leading cause of cancer death in men. Approx approximately about 34,000 men will die this year from prostate cancer. And more than 5,000 of them will be African-American men. However, there's some good news. There's more than 3.1 million men in the United States that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer and are living with prostate cancer and living a quality life. So today, uh, Dr. Woods is going to talk to you during his presentation, as Roger mentioned, he's going to talk to you about what prostate cancer is, uh, what you can do um, to prevent or prevent premature deaths with early detection, and also talk to you about signs and symptoms of prostate cancer and what you can do for the men in your life and for the men, what you can do to prevent dying from uh, premature prostate cancer. So today I present to you a premier urologist and surgeon, a top doctor in the country. Men come from all over to see him. My colleague, my former military friend, my brother from another mother, uh, Dr. Woods. I hope you're online. Yes, Angela, I'm here. Hello, um, everybody. There it is. It's a pleasure seeing and greeting all these lovely faces, especially people that write stories and tell the news. Because Angela, if you want to hear some good news, Dr. Adams has good news. And so my job today is to help you to understand what prostate cancer really is. And uh, Charles, do you have the slide about the anatomy of the prostate? Because I see a lot of women on this uh, this Zoom conference. And I wanna make sure everybody understands where the prostate is located. Okay. So if you see on the illustration, uh, not the one with the finger in the rectum, but at the top portion of the illustration, you can see that on the graph here, you can see that this is the prostate. The prostate is about a walnut sized organ that comes between the bladder and the urethra in the male. The function of that prostate gland is mostly sexual because you see this little tail that comes off the prostate gland, which basically is called the seminal vesicle. It gives rise to all the, the sex fluid, that fluid that comes out with ejaculation. Now, the prostate, as we begin to get older and eat, it begins to swell and this little tube, the urethra, can block off. And so, as we can see, when we do a digital rectal examination of the prostate, we're going through the rectum, as you see in this illustration, and rubbing on the surface of the prostate to see if we can feel a hard nodule. 
Usually in prostate cancer, with early detection, we are able to pick up a nodule in men, but not in all men will show a nodule. So this entail shows the prostate located below the bladder with the urine tube that comes out that goes into the penis. And then it shows a finger on the rectum where we are able to feel the prostate on a clinical exam. Thanks, Charles. So when we develop prostate cancer, these are cells that develop in the prostate that are gone wild. These are normal cells and something happens in the body that these cells give rise to abnormal cells, such as with breast cancer, turns on normal cells to abnormal cells and it gives rise to a cancer. Now we can pick up this cancer in men that are usually 40. Uh, we try to screen at that age and when we talk about screening, we're talking about doing that simple finger, finger examination and also looking at a blood test that we call the PSA, which is prostate specific antigen. So we as black urologists have always established 40 as the starting point. With some of the government issues now, there's, it's making it so that before we can exam or give information to that age group, we have to get informed consent because Many men that we diagnose prostate cancer may be a young cancer or early cancer, and the morbidity can be worse many times with the treatment for that than even early diagnosis. So who gets prostate cancer? Well, because you see Angela and I here, we're representing a community that's hardest hit in America with prostate cancer, Afro-American men, men from the Caribbean, but it's interesting, men from Africa rarely get prostate cancer. But for us on this side of the, the hemisphere, we see a lot of prostate cancer, even in England. Now, we say, is it because of where we're located that we get these cancers? Or is it because of something that we're doing, exposed to? Or is it because of something that we're eating? Or then again, is it genetic? Is it a family thing? And some of the work that Angela and I have been doing, we have been concentrating a lot on genetics. And so you will hear about different genetic germline testing that's going around the country that we've been doing to look at whether or not men are related to prostate cancer because of the same gene, similar to women getting breast cancer called the BRCA. And when you have those genes, one and two, men can have that. And also those men can develop breast cancer as well. So genetics is becoming very important. Say for instance, if your father has prostate cancer or brother has prostate cancer, these are first line people and therefore you have a very high or strong risk and therefore active surveillance as far as screening is something that you want to do at an early age so that you can prevent the untold effects of prostate cancer when it's not detected early on. So as a urologist, what we normally do when a man comes to my office or what we do in some of Angela's screening programs, we do take the blood test and we send that to look at it. A normal PSA is usually a score of say zero to four. Any PSA that's greater than four makes us a little excited as to whether or not there may be cells or something going on in the prostate causing cancer. Now, other things that can cause that rise in PSA greater than a four can be prostate size, can be prostate infection, which we call prostatitis, or if the patient has constipation or any rectal manipulation or sex, that can cause that number to go up because it is a gland, it secretes fluids. And when we talk about this test called the PSA, remember it is not a P PSA is not a name God has given to this test. We're just taking a secretion from the prostate that gets into the bloodstream and we create an antibody and antigen reaction so that we call it a prostate specific antigen. And so it's a reactivity that we are measuring. Now we have other things that we do when we talk about genetic variants. One of the good things that Angela has done for this community, she allowed me to bring on board a research where we looked at the genetics of urine. And how that was so important is that little did we know that black men show more variations for cancer detection with the urine than with the PSA. And what that means is that when you make genetically prostate cancer cells, because your urine excretes certain substances, we can measure a lot of this genetic 
enzyme in the urine that may give rise or give us early signs of prostate cancer. Now, when it comes to prostate cancer in presentation, we're always concerned about what that individual look like. What we do know from research and from statistics is that for obese patients, not that they get a lot of prostate cancer, but those men that have hypertension, try, uh, hypertension, high cholesterol, and they end up having large girths and basically obese, what we call the uh, syndrome X, metabolic syndrome X, these men carry a propensity of having very aggressive prostate cancer. That's why as reporters and people spreading the news, we want to make sure the messages across of eating selectively and eating carefully so that we don't eat those foods that give rise to excitation in the body, giving rise to these diseases. So that's one of the things we have no clear cut information as far as smoking, giving rise to this disease. But we say for people that do smoke, nicotine can give rise to all types of carcinogenic stimulation. And therefore, those are things that we look at as well. What helps us to decrease the, 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 the prevalence of the disease is a population of people that are healthy, that eat healthy, that eat more of the dark green leafy vegetables, stay away from all the milk products, the fatty products, and also the high rich sugar products, carbohydrates. Remember one of the things that you can take away from this lecture about prostate cells is that prostate cells are given to us at birth, but what makes them grow where we get this phenomenon called BPH, which is benign prostatic hyperplasia, is the stimulation of these cells from certain food types. And most of that is like sugar stimulus. The research is still out, but in my patient population, I pretty much zero in on the sugar content to make them a sugar-free environment because we know for those men that eat less sugar and eat more dark green leafy vegetables like the collard greens, the callaloo, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, the kale, those are like plants on earth that help us fight off a lot of diseases, they're very healthy for us. So Angela, I hope I haven't really gone over my time because she knows I can be like the Baptist preacher and start preaching you a sermon about the prostate. But at this juncture, anybody <clears throat> want to ask me a particular question before I go forward? Well, doctor, you mentioned the, the leafy green stuff. What about uh, proteins? What about meats? Um, do they um, enhance the problem or um, what do you say about, about meats in general, proteins? Well, I don't know if I'm sitting in the arena of meat eating individuals. Uh, <laughs> the thing about meat in this environment is that we have done clinical research and one of the classic books um, that we talk about is the China study by Dr. Campbell. And he talks about how meat has influenced the propensity of environments getting cancer. Say for instance, like in Sweden, they eat a lot of red meat and drink a lot of milk, eat a lot of cheese. They have a higher rate of prostate cancer than we do. And that might be one of the, the coefficients of looking at Western black men, men here in America, men in uh, the Caribbean. We have diets that are influenced by the British about how we eat and therefore adding on a lot of meat so to answer your question, I'm not one to push a lot of meat eating because meats can be a factor in causing cancers as far as development, especially red meats. We have to be careful with the types of meat, even fish. We talk about wild fish versus farm-raised fish because of the chemicals that are attached to farm raised that may be carcinogenic that we're consuming. Chicken, when we think about hormone stimulation and the pesticides and herbicides and other things that they get in order to grow big breasts. And remember in our meat industry, what we never talk about or what's not openly discussed is how much of our meat industry is associated with the production of viruses. Because viruses can be good viruses and in order to grow certain types of food, like chicken with big breasts, we inject them with certain viruses that carries the DNA so that that body will make thick chicken breasts, beef cattle to make them 
great cattle bigger than just simply grass fed, we do use viruses. One of the theories about cancer formation is the invasion of viruses into cell genomes that may give rise to abnormal DNA that may give rise to cancer cells. I would like, I would like, like to ask about um, Euroflow. They say there's this new procedure with, with people who are um, you know, having problems with going to, to the bathroom too much. And they say that this Euroflow is a new device that will keep you from having to ta- use medicine to control. And it's like stapling back something in the prostate. I'm not really sure the details on that. Yeah, you're talking about treatment of benign prostatic hyperplasia where there's an obstructive component. And sure, we're using devices where we are actually putting like a rubber band on each side of the lobes of the prostate to cause it to open up so that you don't have decrease in your flow. And so that is available. It's been around about 10 years. There's some increased popularity about it. But remember, the traditional treatment for blockage of the prostate has always been the transurethral resection of the prostate, which is known as the TERP, or most people in the military remember it as rotor rooter. But yes, we have other things such as heat. We have other things such as uh, hypothermia that basically shrinks the prostate. We can we have things like a high fu high intensity ultrasound frequency that we use, and that can be used to treat benign disease. And Angela can tell you about projects that we've gone to Dominican Republic and to Mexico where we've done these studies on citizens from our United States that went with us in order to have these special non-invasive treatments done. Now they become a hallmark for treatments in the United States where you can get this done, but during the day when I was one of the experimenters for this project, people were paying as much as $30,000 just to get that done. But to answer your question, yes, using these rubber bands and different procedures to pull the prostate open has become a standard. All prostates don't meet the criteria because if your prostate is greater than a certain size, and if the lobes grow in a certain way where they're blocking with three lobes versus the two, it is hard to make you a candidate for that. So your doctor would have to do different tests. We do cystoscopies, looking inside the channel to make sure you can be a candidate and look at the size of the prostate. And the way we look at the size of the prostate today, interestingly, MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is now becoming a a gold standard. With that, we can look at the size of the prostate to give a measurement And that test itself, not using x-ray, will tell us about the localization of areas in the prostate that are suspicious for prostate cancer. And we can then take a device and do biopsies that are focused into those tumors that we see on magnetic resonance imaging, which is MRI, which has now become a gold standard for staging prostate cancer. Dr. Woods, can I redirect you? Oh, please do, sister. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what are the prostate cancer risk factors and how, um, and can prostate cancer be found early? Yes. Um, we talked about the family uh, risk factors. We talked about dietary risk factors. Uh, we talk about environment risk factors for those that have served in the military that have been exposed to Agent Orange. Uh, that is one of the big things that the military will have a disability for you because of that, that, that we recognize. The other risk factor is even being a fireman, being exposed to smoke. We're not sure what has caused them to be at risk for prostate cancer, but we are seeing that in the population as far as a risk factor. And Angela, what was your other question you asked me? Um, you had talked about um, um, how to, to uh, detect prostate cancer and can it be found early? Yes, it can be found early. And that's why I was alluding to the point of the screening programs that we had set up through the Afro-America, the Black Men's Health Summit, which is basically men at, we say 40, as Black urologists, we always say, have a conversation with your doctor at age 40. The government has now pushed that to 45, and the standard screening starts at 54 to 69. What they're saying from clinical studies is that from looking at comorbidities and deaths, 
well, they don't advise us to try to do rectal exams and stage people earlier than the 54. But if there's a family history, if there are the risk factors, as I mentioned, firemen, if there's a risk factor where you have some genetic variation and germline students, uh, tumors where the mother has breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and you see that in the female side, sure, we look at that as a family possible germline tumor where you may have early detection that needs to be done so that you don't end up with the disease and then the, the disease become very bad at the time that we pick it up. Hey, Doc, can you hear me? This is Charles. Hey, Charles. Hey, um, question for you. Um, oh, by the way, thank you for, for not having extremely large hands. I appreciate that. Uh, pe people, <laughs> because you're my urologist. Hey, listen, um, when it comes to the, <laughs> to the prostate um, treatment, um, uh, cancer itself, can you talk a little bit about uh, sex life after you've gone through the treatment and cancer itself. Can you talk um, about where we are in some of the different stages of the probability of sex, normal sex? What what are some of the options now if there's a problem at all? Can, uh, before you answer that, can you tell us what the signs and symptoms of prostate cancer is? The greatest sign and symptom of prostate cancer is no signs. Uh, most people that are detected with prostate cancer, the majority not don't have any symptoms. But one of the things that can happen is frequency of urination, having to get up throughout the night, straining to void, lower back pain, having blood in the urine can be some cardinal signs, not only say prostate cancer, but can be of normal benign prostatic hyperplasia. And that's where a relationship with the urologist is important to determine which is which. When we see the cardinal signs of blood in the urine, lower back pain, we're very concerned that this may be a very advanced stage of prostate cancer uh, on presentation. Hi, Dr. Woods. Then you can answer Charles' question, I guess. Well, someone else is asking me something. I guess, Dr. Woods, um, this is Mrs. Thomas. I'd like you to also address, I have a background in nursing, I'd like you to also address the um, not just the posture, but the effect of the diabetics with this uh, posture, as well as other urinary issues that can evolve from being a uh, diabetic. Well, you know, being a diabetic opens up a door to, you know, what we call the metabolic uh, X syndrome and that for having sugar out of control, sugar affects the vessels and it affects the nerves. Uh, we don't have any classical studies to say that diabetics are more prone to get cancers more than other people. But I will say to you, diabetics, many of them fall into the category of being obese or not having good diets. And poor diets can be a problem and a factor in causing more a presentation for prostate cancer, but in my practice, I can't say to you, and even in the literature, that simply being a diabetic puts you at risk for prostate cancer. It puts you at risk for frequency, urgency, uh, neuropathic bladder. It puts you at risk for having urinary tract infections or recurrent prostatitis. It puts you at risk of having so much frequency because the sugar molecule is so large that when you excrete it in the body, it pulls the water molecules with it because it can't be absorbed. And that's one of the problems that diabetics have is frequency of urination. And we call it uh, polyuria, being thirsty, wanting to drink a lot and therefore avoiding a lot. Okay, another question, and I think this is what the gentleman ahead of me was alluding to. Is there, with that posture and the procedures, or even the onset of posture cancer, would it cause ED, or can it cause ED? Um, I yes. Well, let me just talk, let me just see if I can keep my favorite subject brief. brief. That is talking about sex. So the big fear is, Will prostate cancer take away my sex? And so what we have shown this community is that with early detections, you're able to put a safety net around your sex. Why that's important is because when you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, say, for instance, 
If you're diagnosed with a very early cancer, our treatment recommendations can include a process that we call active surveillance. With active surveillance, it's a very aggressive approach to change how you eat, how you exercise, so that your body reverse process is ongoing so that you can maintain your sexual ability, maintain a good testosterone, and not have to lower that. Now, when we do diagnose prostate cancer and we have to put a treatment arm and give you treatment, that treatment, number one, for most men that come in with prostate cancer is localized to the prostate. You hear people talk about surgery. Most of the surgeries that's done now is robotic surgery, where with the punctures in the belly, we're able to take the prostate out and reconnect the urinary system with sparing the blood vessels to the penis. And that is one of the things that has been done with greater success than it was in years ago, where we had these surgeries. I won't call them antiquated, but we had surgical procedures that did not respect or spare those blood vessels. And therefore, the men ended up with severe impotence and leakage issues. Today, you rarely hear men talking about inability to get erections after the surgeries. But if it does happen, we do have remedy. We have programs such as platelet-rich plasma, shock wave, which are things where we give you back your platelets into the penis to revitalize the penis. And shock wave, which is a new modality to shock the penis into a realization of blood flow that helps you to increase and reproduce the tissue that you've lost. Then we have penile prosthesis, which are implants that can be placed just like a woman get breast implants. We can put those into the penis that helps a man where he pumps it up and he's able to have intercourse. Now, when it comes to a treatment such as radiation, radiation is localized so that they make sure they don't radiate the neurovascular bundles and the, and the vessels that come into the prostate and the treatment is basically core prostate. So they have a better chance of not having problems with erectile dysfunction, say then the typical surgical patient. Then we have another thing called freezing where we can freeze the component of the prostate and freeze that cancer. We can either freeze it locally to one side in a focal treatment or we can freeze the entire prostate. Now, when we freeze, the problem with freezing is controlling the ice ball. And many times that may affect the vessels and nerves and impotence can be a slight problem. But remember with new techniques of treating erectile dysfunction with the PRP, with the shockwave therapy, with implants, it becomes almost like a mute issue. Now, the other factor is that we have HIFU, which I did mention, and HIFU was a very favorite treatment of mine in the Caribbean when we were going, and why that was a favorite, because we were localizing the ultrasound energy to certain spots of the prostate to destroy it without getting into the nerves and the vessels of that prostate, therefore keeping that man very functional. So the fear of losing all and prostate cancer diagnosis is becoming less and less of a fear. And that's the phobia that we have to help the community to understand is that if you don't get this thing diagnosed early and treated, it's a fatality. It leads to death and it leads to a lifestyle that you're never happy with. But when there's knowledge, which is what Angela's <laughs> research project is incorporating, hopefully to give people more opportunity for knowledge and, and making very good decisions early on, we can prevent a lot of the fears that people have. And most of that fear for men is losing their ability to have sex. So now here's my concern, because as far as even being a, a nurse, as well as a degree with um, health service administration, my concern is that this material should be taught in the junior and high school level and early early college levels so that the children that are not exposed to this type of health environment will know and it'll be instilled in them that after 25, 35, start looking forward to this pre-treatment because we already know that um, most low-income families are predisposed to a lot of medical variants that have caused them to be high in, ca in the cancer, high in the diabetes, high in all those debilitating type illnesses. So if we can start teaching 
our children, our young men, our boys from junior high school on up, especially in the fact that they've become sexually active early, we begin to teach them about sexual transmitted diseases. They also need to know how to protect that reproductive system in their bodies and the urinary systems in their bodies. So what's being done for that, Dr. Woods? What are they doing well, to educate our children? Ms. Tubson, let me just tell you, in front of you, you have the world's greatest expert that has created a community project handling those populations. And that's why I'm a medical director for the 20 years I've worked with Dr. Adams. You will see volunteers, which are women and men of different age groups. And then you heard in the introduction, she's not only helped with us, older people bringing us together, Imagine coming to the convention center at eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday and black men are there punctually in the thousands, in the thousands Wonderful. for years. Wonderful. And then at the same time, upstairs are young black men being counseled by her staff under Dr. Adams leadership. So the problem we have is who gives the donations and who supports a warrior like Dr. Adams? That's I the agree. problem. And so I, what she, what one of the things that we have on the table today is her research project of creating the artificial intelligence to do exactly that you are asking for. And that's her research project today. Well, I, so I have to say that I also, I, I worked the Men's Health Summit over the years. And I agree with you, Dr. Adams, you do a phenomenal job getting black men to present at the convention center, having worked there, you know, a few years ago. My question, Dr. Woods, when a patient at the age of 40, black man, presents, um, does a urinalysis determine whether he gets a prostate exam by the result of it, the enzyme and the urinalysis, or does it come together, a prostate exam and a urinalysis? Let me, do kind of correct. Let me just help you to understand when I alluded to the urine, that uh -huh. is a special test. Remember, we're in an age now where we're using uh, DNA. We're using DNA to detect everything, who raped whatever, whose semen it is. And so we can determine DNA on you even without you being on site, just taking stuff off of a handle. So when we do the urine DNA for prostate cancer, that is only sent after we do a digital rectal exam. We massage the prostate so we can actually get secretions of the prostate fluid in the urine. And then that urine is preserved and sent for a special DNA analysis looking for certain enzymes that we only see present when there is prostate cancer coming from cancer cells. See how that works? I but understand simple, now. Okay. That the simple urinalysis doesn't give us that detailed information, but the special tests, we have them for bladder cancer. We have them for a lot of cancers where we're looking at the DNA. The DNA, like the coronavirus that we have, people are swiving, doing PCRs. This is what we're at. This is, we're looking at DNA and the DNA samples, it leaves a footprint. It leaves a pathway for us to say, oh, that's Sarah's DNA because it matches up on the computer. And that's how we're able to use it in order to detect prostate cancer early. Thank you for that. Thank you. Very good. I just like to make a comment. Um, if you go to a physician, whether it's a urologist or a family practice and you're male, or you go with your husband or loved one, if they come out happy that they didn't have to do the DRE, they just got the PSA or prostate-specific um, antigen test, then that physician is doing a disservice. You have to have a DRE, a digital rectal exam. So it's just like for us, if we went to the get a mammogram and they only um, uh, did a mammogram on one breast. So it comes as a pair. You have to get, okay. you have to have both. And you'll see some places that will offer a PSA. That's just a way to get you, get them uh, maybe better than nothing. And Dr. Woods can address that. 
but you you if your physician says oh we don't we're not going to be just going to do a PSA you need to um advocate for yourself and say that's just half of you're just telling half of the story because with the summit we have had plenty of black men that had a normal PSA blood test but their digital rectal exam was abnormal and if mm. we only did the PSA they would have been walking around thinking that they were okay now um I see that my comrade James Crawford is online well we've had to play detective because he's a former detective to find those men that skipped out they just got their PSA and then they tried to skip out we said no 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 you gotta come back and get the DRE so um, you, I just want to emphasize you need to have both. Am I correct, Dr. Wood? You're correct, Angela. And also you have to add the third factor because from your research and abstracts that are now published on PCA3, which was one of the first markers we used oh, to detect yeah. prostate cancer. We had a lot of men at the summit that did have digital rectal exams and normal PSAs, but that urine score on DNA was high. And when we brought them back for ultrasound and biopsy, we found some of these aggressive tumors in some of these men. And we were very surprised because they would have been missed. It's like having a PSA less than 0.1 in a regular exam. And if she tells you about most doctors aren't doing the digital rectal exams, imagine in my practice, after we did that research project, everybody started getting screened on the PCA3. The big problem we had in private practice, insurance companies didn't want to pay for it. They said it's experimental. But we found that it was a great handle for Black men because if we just used PSA alone, they would have been missed. And they mm. get answers when we send them to our scientific lab to look at the DNA of the actual tissue. The tissue comes back showing a very aggressive cancer, even in some of the younger black men. So she's absolutely right. The digital rectal exam, the PSA, and I'm a, one of those advocates of urine PCA3, but now we're doing an MDX, which is a similar study looking at two different genetic markers. And most doctors in America don't do it because it takes time and most insurances don't want to pay for it, but you can make a great argument and they're stuck with paying for it. And it's so important because that's one of the little hidden pearls that we've learned from Dr. Uh, Adams' work. If we didn't do that research project with her guys, that little pearl that I'm just telling you about would have never been known. And that was a published study, thanks to Dr. Adams and her devotion to helping Black men with this early detection and getting the right tools so that we don't lose our Black men. Can you speak on the, oh, is it, and I may be misquoting this, um, Dr. Miller and I was talking about it the other day, the prostate membrane. Dr. Miller, you want to mention that? It was the uh, prostate membrane test. Are you? I guess he went offline. Okay, we'll move on. Prostate membrane. membrane. I'm I'm probably misspeaking, but he we had talked about it. Um, but that's fine. I, I I see he must have stepped away. He and he he was talking to me about it. So in conclusion, um, what do you think that every man should know about prostate cancer? In conclusion, what every man should know about prostate cancer, as I mentioned about early detection at age 40, and nearly 97% of African-American men that are diagnosed with prostate cancer in the early stages are still alive five years after the diagnosis. And Exercising regularly, maintaining a healthy weight, eating a heart healthy diet can also reduce the risk factors of prostate cancer. And if someone in your family has been diagnosed with prostate cancer, your risk increases and make sure you talk to your doctor so that you can be examined so that you, he can understand where you fit in that risk ratio. Okay. I'm glad to hear you discuss the whole realm of um, prostate. And it kind of reminds me of at one point, the doctors would do 
sigmoidoscopies and they would just do half of your colon and miss the other half. Right. So in what happens, a lot of people came down with colon cancer because they didn't do a whole colonoscopy. Again, you mentioned insurance plays a part. And I know this is about prostate, but again, it's um, doing the entire exam and not part of the exam. And that's what happened when they were only doing sigmoidoscopies instead of the entire colon, which was a total colonoscopy. And that changed over the years. So it, it's, this is very good information. Thank you. You know, that's a great comment. And I didn't make it. I didn't say anything about it. But in my practice of medicine, with the research that we've done with Dr. Adams, when men come into the office, they say, why are you checking my thyroid? Why are you massaging my breasts? Why are you checking my testicles? These are some of the high points of other areas where cancer develop in our men. Uh, in my practice last year, I had over five men with breast cancer undergoing surgeries. And when you pick up breast cancer in men, most times you're too late. And then I've had about four people with thyroid cancers. And do you know, most doctors don't touch patients in those areas. And so one of the things in healthcare that we're missing is looking at the whole person and not Perfect. just focusing on one part, as she said. And the summit has been so helpful to help educate people about all these different types of cancers, especially in our young men. Testicular cancer is still around. It still occurs. But who's checking testicles and teaching men how to massage their testicles every day when they shower? How to massage their breasts? Yes, men do get breast cancer. And especially if there's the family component, mother with breast cancer, mother colon, I mean, surgical, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, there are risk components to that male because of genetics. And they really need to have counseling and cold close follow-up. And diet, as we said, changing lifestyle is so important. Thank you. That is a great segue to uh, the research that we're doing, um, which is knowledge is power. And so with that, um, we are doing a research um, in the goal of our, uh, it's a novel project to improve shared decision-making for Black men who have been diagnosed with early stage prostate cancer. Uh, studies show that um, African-American men have limited access to the recommended, just basic recommended prostate cancer information, and they don't get all the information that they need when they make their treatment decisions, which is vital to share decision-making. And there's a lot, you know, and that was one of the, when you talk about disparities, if you don't understand your treatment modalities or you just get anecdotal information and you're not really making an informed decision, then the outcome is going to be, uh, some, sometimes the outcomes aren't out as well. So, you know, a lot, when you, um, when someone's diagnosed with cancer, they, they, uh, they give you a lot of books. And actually, when you usually when you hear the word cancer, your mind just turns off. You know, you don't hear what they're saying, you know. So with with that, um, um, trying to help decrease disparities is increasing the knowledge, but not only increasing the knowledge, but providing it in a way that is culturally appropriate, that men can understand it. And that's one of the things that the health summit was able to do provide a non-threatening environment made uh learning fun and that people ask questions about it so um we were we were uh provided a grant and i don't know if you can um show the flyer charles charles and um so so i can kind of talk about the flyer but the project is going to develop a patient decision aid tool to help eliminate prostate cancer disparities by providing information to, um, to men about their treatment options so they can intelligently ask the physician questions and be able to be really a part of that. We're gonna use uh, artificial intelligence to develop um, the product. And so what's unique about it is we're calling it community-based participatory research 
which we have, I'm glad to see we have some of our um, uh, advisory board members on the call today. And basically we're getting input from the community and from people that have been affected by prostate cancer to see what information do you want to know? What information that wasn't provided to you that you think that other men need to know? So we're recruiting um, to try to start our focus groups in October. So the criteria for, the, um, for participating and helping us develop this patient decision aid that a man can use to help them decide what treatment option that works best for them is, um, is what we're going to do. And so we're looking for men that have been, black men that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. We're looking for black men over 30 who have never been diagnosed with prostate cancer. We're looking for um, people that are interested about, interested in prostate cancer uh, and the outcome for black men, which would include maybe a spouse of a prostate cancer survivor, a caregiver, or just a friend, or just anyone that's interested in making sure that the men are getting information that, that we need, that they, you think that they need. Also, we have a focus group for our healthcare providers, which, are, which will include physicians, nurses, social workers, or anyone in the healthcare team. It can be pharmacists, physical therapists, anyone that actually have worked or work with men that have been diagnosed with prostate cancer. And then lastly, uh, prostate cancer advocates, people that just care about prostate cancer and health disparities. Um, there's going to be two focus, focus groups. Um, each focus group is like two hours. We're going to do a focus group um, starting in October, and hopefully we're going to finish this year, if not uh, January. And then you'll be invited to participate in the, you'll provide input in how the device will look like, what information you think should be in the device, on the device, or how the device would work. And then we're going to, our team, uh, our research team, which we have uh, individuals that represent each one of these groups that we talked about from the study group, and then they're going to come and they're going to put their input. We have engineers, engineers, scientists, and we're going to come up with a product. And so we'll invite you back in 20, late 22, 2022 or early 2023 and ask you um, to critique our product and see what you think about it and to use it. And uh, for your time um, in participating, uh, each uh, person will get a $100 um, gift card for participating. <laughs> so we're, um, our total focus group, um, total numbers that we're looking for is about 50 people. And if you interested, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a pen, I write down our phone number and our email, and we can send you the flyer and, and additional information. And then we have a request to participate that you will fill out and we'll get back with you. So if you have a pencil, our phone number is 407-647-9339. That's 407-647-9339. And the email, if you want to just email us, uh, you can email Tony, and his email is T O N Y W dot C F P C. So it's Tony, T O N Y W dot C F P C at gmail dot com. And, uh, and I'll open it back up to Dr. Woods. If anybody has any inf uh, questions, I'll be willing to answer those. But we're really excited. This is the first time something like this has been done with using uh, artificial intelligence to get the information out. But as, as uh, I saw some of the chat um, blogs on here that information is important and information is powerful and knowledge is powerful and the, our education is going to help our men live longer. And it's, it takes a village. So, you know, the women, we need to be able to put in, have input with the product because we become end users too, because usually um, uh, the male, we're part of the treatment plan. We're going to help out with that. We're providing advice, whether they want it or not. We're going to give our advice and we can give 
knowledgeable information that will help them with their treatment decisions. And again, I want to thank you all for giving myself and Dr. Woods this opportunity to talk about something that is near and dear to my heart. We can uh, take the flyer off. I'm, I'm good, but we'll be willing to. Marsha, can I send that to you and then you can send it out to your group? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Thank um, you. I do have a question for you, uh, Dr. Adams. Um, what, what do you consider uh, to be the barriers to African-Americans um, being screened for prostate cancer in our community? Well, I think that when the, um, they came out with different guidelines about screenings, that it, it confused people. And depending on... Um, which guideline you look at, and some of the some of the providers won't start screening to age 45 or maybe even 50. And so I think that the barrier, <laughs> most insurance companies will pay for it after age 40. I think the, the barrier is a lack of, of knowledge, um, the attitude that it won't happen to me. Um, some of the men, and it's so important to learn your family history, as Dr. Woods mentioned, you know, if your father or your uncle had prostate cancer, you at a higher risk. Or if your mom had breast cancer or uterine cancer, you're at a higher risk with the risk factors. And it's just really taking time um, to, you know, to to go to the physician. So I think that those are some of the barriers that they don't take the time. And doctor's offices are open eight to five. And a lot of times people work and, you know, they just you know, they don't fit it in their schedule. But a lot of, uh, some of the organizations do provide uh, screenings through, the, you know, the month of September. But I would say the biggest barrier is lack of knowledge and how important, you know, and um, how important it is to know than to not know. And uh, well, along those lines, um, I know your program um, has been very well received. Um, and you've been doing it for about 20 years, am I correct? Right, correct. correct. So um, have you been able to measure um, how much the awareness to the importance of having this done has been from back then to where we are now? Um, what we do do, what we did before is we did pre and post tests. Um, and we took that, we got that information and with our research project, we're going to uh, do a pretest for the people that participate. And then afterwards, when they learn how to use the decision aid, we'll do a post test um, uh, for that. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions um, for Dr. Woods or Dr. Adams? I have a question for Dr. Woods. Certainly. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. My name is Tom, and uh, there's a procedure called um, prostate artery immobilization performed by an interventional radiologist, and I hadn't heard much about that, and I was wondering uh, what his opinion on that was. Tom, thanks for bringing that up. Uh, is prostate uh, artery embolization? Uh, that is a process where in men who have prostate enlargement and obstruction, and some that have low-grade cancers, we're able to put coils, uh, coils into the arterial vessels of the prostate to stop blood flow, and therefore causes the prostate to basically, say, infarct or just slowly disintegrate. That has been a great uh, procedure. Uh, it is relatively, I would say, it's not really new, but in this area, I've been working with quite a few of the interventional radiologists at Advent Health, where we have some committed interventionists that are doing it. I've been using that primarily on men that have had prostates that have had bleeding, prostates that are larger than the ones that we typically resect around 30 grams. Oh. Hey, so I, have you prostates. must have said the way I had asked you. I was talking about you and I was asking you to ask. Angela. Oh. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, there was. <laughs> there, yeah, prostates that are like 200 grams or more 
that you don't want to take out surgically, it has been a noble approach to correcting for the symptoms of obstruction and also even for those with early stage prostate cancer. So um, for an enlarged prostate um, that undergoes this, does it, is it long lasting or temporary till new arteries form or good arteries form? Well, you know, the treatment is to devascularize the main arteries to the prostate, which we identify. But, you know, there are always not only main arteries, there are some minor arteries to the prostate and other vessels because the prostate sits underneath the bladder. And sure, revascularization takes place. If we block off one artery, your body seems to find blood supply to get to that tissue from somewhere else. But for the long term, for most men that I've done the procedure on or have, it, haven't, have had it done on, they have done very well. And for most of them, they're up in age, over 70, that I've done them. And it has been a life-saving type of event because for those people that can't void and have to have the routine operation, it may take several surgeries or an open surgery to enucleate that prostate, which may lead to a strain on their actual lifestyle or their their heart condition and many men in that age can undergo a major operation so it's been a life-saving event i think i'm one of the urologists in the community that have sent many men for this i'm one of those that like uh non-invasive procedures and when we talk about non-invasive procedures that mean for urologists i don't get to do that procedure i'm sending that to someone who has the ability to do that but it has been a good operation in my practice, the outcome data has been good, very good, good. And also, Marcio, I wanted to answer your question as to Angela in the research from the summit. We have found in this local community, the prevalence of the disease changed and also the death rate changed because we were at one point doing some research projects looking for stage D, that is the terminal stage, pretty much a prostate cancer. We could not find them through the summit because these men have been coming habitually every year, educating themselves. And all of a sudden, we're stuck with men that have early stage, if any, disease. So when you educate a population and you look at the end result, her project has really made statistical difference. It's just that in this competing element of how we live, the problem you have with having a summit and a health conscious director as Angela is the same problem you run up against. And how do we go about controlling, you know, coronavirus? Who do we educate and how do we educate? Because everybody has a conversation. But when we show results for black men that are showing up at eight in the morning on sharp, they're, they're there and they stay. And they come for 20 years and they bring people from everywhere. That is a product that the world needs to know about. Guess what? Getting funding can be very difficult because getting the grants and getting people to fund a success is a problem. They like negative statistics, but we didn't have the death rate and we didn't have the collateral morbidities to support why we need to have this. Because people were coming, they were getting educated, not only in prostate cancer, but in everything that had to do with the men's health. They became an educated community and the women <clears throat> loved it because the women would make sure they're out of their houses. Churches loved it because they had teams in the churches organized to make sure they did not miss the summit. And they were all there by the busloads. And this is the first project I've seen because I and from a family of the syphilis study survivors. My great aunt, who was a registered nurse in New York with a master's degree from NYU, her father, who was at Tuskegee, a professor, was a victim. And therefore, I never knew until I went to a urology convention, and there it is, my grandfather's, great-grandfather's name is posted on a board, and they're talking about some of the horrors of the public health system in America. Let's go back to today. Why are we missing getting people vaccinated? It's the same issue that Angela had to overcome with the summit. 
and her project has been successful for 20 years, well, we have more men in this community that will educate you on why early detection is so important versus other communities that try to duplicate this project and fail. Wow, it would seem as though the federal government would be behind a program that is continually showing perpetual improvement, especially from a morbidity standpoint. Um, you know, certain things the government does just really baffles me. Um, but, but Marcia, is it the government or is it the big top 10 insurance companies and is it the big pharmaceutical companies because we make money on cancer in this country mm -hmm. that produces an economy that keeps America being great so if you keep everybody sick you keep everybody on drugs and medications you can get the pharmaceutical companies to make money and who gives them that money the insurance companies who charges us high premiums and give us very little to live on not I agree. Very good. That is absolutely true. It's the insurance companies. That's it. That, oh, it's wow. so true. Nobody in the group, I would say, has ever seen the CEO of the top 10 insurance companies in America, and they live in different worlds. And during the pandemic, when it first came, they were all in New Zealand in underground condos. Mm -hmm. And we're over here stressing they have money. They have million dollar bonuses on top of our premiums and they give us very little. And the only time we get anything from an insurance company is when we die and we're too dead to spend it. You are absolutely wow. right. <laughs> wow. Oh my goodness. I, Gwen, I see your hand has been up. You're on uh, the It's good to see you, Dr. Adams. It, I, I feel like I was like one of the first people, one of the first sponsors at the summit. Remember how many years ago that was. But anyway, I'm so glad to see both both you, Dr. Woods and Dr. Adams. Uh, what I want to know, do you have, because I'm still out there in the street uh, with the client and uh, when I visit them, I do have an opportunity to leave some literature uh, with the guys, um, and is there, do you have a, um, like library or place that you have some literature that's geared toward the Afrocentric male that I could give out while I'm out there? Uh, and we're talking about health. I can't hear you. You're on mute. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, I like to mention um, uh, Center for Change, where Peggy Burgess is the executive director. They're actually doing a lot of education with prostate cancer. They actually did some screening last week. I can get, she has information and I can get that. I can get her, we can exchange. I can get that information to you. But there are uh, brochures that are available through American Cancer Society. Uh, society and CDC that is Afrocentric. Okay, that'll be good. I can take them with me and give them to them personally and add some stories to it. Thank you so much and thank you for everything you did. I've been there many years. I remember when, when we first started, I felt so, it was like only a few ladies there with all these guys. And it was like, I took an agent with me and she's like, Gwen, this is a great thing to be doing here at the Afro-American Male Summit, <laughs> but you know, anyway, great job. And I'm just so happy to see and appreciate all your work. Thank you both. Yes, yes, for sure. So, um, and I totally concur with what you just said, Gwen. Um, good to see you, Dr. Adams and Dr. Woods. Uh, Yolanda Triplett worked for a lot of years as a volunteer. Uh, and you, you both have been so on point. Um, but I do have a question in as much as since the uh, summit has, uh, since the lights shut down on the summit, so to speak, in terms of that gathering and just the beauty of seeing all of those black men, as Dr. Woods uh, kept alluding to, showing up early and being a volunteer, I would see them there early. 
um, and coming by the bus loads, not, you know, from all over Central Florida. That was just such a beautiful thing. Um, what have you seen in your research since that gap of the gathering has not, um, you know, been in place? What have you seen in terms of those numbers? Certainly, I know from a standpoint of that um, opportunity to have a large forum and to be able to uh, yeah, share faster, faster. Uh, with information and things, but um, what have you seen in terms of the numbers um, with uh, regards to uh, detection and um, those things? Well, since then, again, Center for Change in and- Center for Multicultural Health and Wellness with the Marie Francois. They had been doing some um, some screenings, and um, and those Seminole County uh, had done some screenings. And then with the um, Obamacare, where more people were insured and they're able to go for um, for um, screenings uh, through their primary care physician. But as far as statistics, I'm not uh, sure, but I know that. Prostate uh, for the last couple of years, prostate cancer was uh, deaths were decreasing, but now it's back up is rising again. And maybe Dr. Woods can speak to that. So I think that uh, you're seeing more. And um, a colleague of mine, Tom Farrington, he has uh, FIN, which is Prostate Health Education Network, and he's doing programs nationally. And I know he's been in the uh, Jacksonville in the Tampa area, he actually has a, uh, a play, a theater role play called Daddy's Girls. If anybody wants to Google him, it's called Finn, and they have episodes and they've been, it's about prostate cancer, and it's funny, kind of like a Tyler Perry um, theater production. So there's other groups out there that are kind of focusing to the Florida area, but as far as statistics, I'm not really sure how many people dropped off. Um, with not getting their exams once we stop. I'm not really sure. Dr. Woods, did you have anything to add? Okay. Well, I, I, Marcy, I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know it's been exciting. You know, maybe we can come back next year or, uh, but definitely, um, with uh, if you can get the word out about uh, being a part of uh, research, this is very innovative. It's the first time that a community-based organization has gotten a research project like this. Usually, we're working for um, a part of a university's um, program or project. Yeah. And I'm excited to say that um, I'm a principal investigator, and we have the universities that are co-investigator. We're working with. Uh, Florida A&M, uh, University of Central Florida. So it's so a great opportunity um, for the community to get involved. And it's an old saying that I've heard somewhere that said, if the problem is in the community, then more than likely the solution is there too. So it'd be a, a great opportunity. So I hope everyone takes advantage with either participating with our research project or getting the word out. And definitely once we get our results back from that, we would love to be invited to show you our product in a couple of years. And again, thank you for uh, inviting us. And I know we infringed on the other speaker. I'm so sorry about that, but I'm happy that we were able to import, impart some um, insightful and life-saving information. Dr. Adams, can I put a word in right quick? Yes, I don't know. Who's yes, doing. absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. This oh. is Earl Mike. This is Earl Mike, M-I-K-E, and I volunteered my time for about five years with the summit, and um, I, I do professional photography, and I, I just uh, re-energize a local website that uh, that's part of my website, and for anyone that, that has not had an opportunity to look back on the Men's Health Summit over the past 20 year time frame, I've uploaded about 454 images, 454 photos are at your fingertip right now for wow. you to take a walk down memory lane and see some of the prominent guest speakers that Dr. Adams had over the years. Uh, and in addition to that, 
Uh, I think uh, Miss Triplett, Yolanda, I'm looking at, I think I, I'm looking at your photo right now. So you need to go and log in and see, you haven't changed. I'm just letting you know right now, whatever you're eating, continue to eat. All right. But uh, it's a perfect opportunity, uh, Dr. Adams, if you'd like to disseminate or put that website out, we can do that. And it just gives an opportunity uh, for those who have never had an opportunity to, to look at the summit or get a, a, a bird's eye view. It gives a complete pictorial overview, not only prostate screening, but dental. Uh, we had Dr. Baker. Uh, can I just say that Dr. Woods really saved my life? And I'm going to tell you, I went to the summit, I listened. And as my urologist, uh, I am a VA veteran, 21-year combat veteran from Vietnam, and I was hooked on that PSA. Well, my PSA was very low. Well, hey, so I'm good to go. Well, Dr. Willis wasn't taking that. And he said, in addition to that PSA, you need to look at that urine. And it was because of my urine test that he took that he was able to detect that particular enzyme. And thank God that we did additional testing. Uh, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, had no idea. But uh, my father was a prostate cancer survivor. And I won't tell you who actually did his prostate surgery. You won't believe me. Well, who, brother? Well, if I were to say Dr. Abraham Woods, would you believe me? <laughs> All right. And he had his prostate surgery in his 70s, and thank God he lived to be 95 years of age. Wow. All right? So I'm just here to tell y'all that uh, the mm -hmm. summit, I can't wait for Dr. Adams to re-energize this and to give her a little bit more motivation Again, 454 photos are online right now, and I will give that information to you, Dr. Adams, so you can have your participants go and log in and walk down memory lane. Miss Triplett, what's, you what's need to walk. What's your website, oh, Earl? Okay. What's your website? Just go to, uh, go to right now, EWM Photography, that's Edward William Mike photography, EWM photography dot Zenfolio, Z-E-N-F-O-L-I-O, Zenfolio dot com. EWM photography dot Zenfolio dot com. Once you go to the gallery, pull up, you will see a uh, visit the gallery by clicking on Black Men's Health Summit. Once you have clicked on that particular gallery, Black Men's Health Summit, enter the password H-O-P-E. Hope. <laughs> Type in hope. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Did everybody get hope? So, <laughs> EWM Photography dot Zenfolio dot com. Once you go to the gallery, I put on, it in the I put it in the chat. So it's there. Is there? It's in the chat. Okay. All right. Outstanding. So, y'all look at Doctor Woods. In his younger days. Amen. I'm finished. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Wow, thank you. Um, well, to Dr. Adams, and wait a minute, we have one more question. We have time enough for one more question. Mercedes, your hand is up. I am here. I'm sorry. Hello? Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you for having me. I'm a pharmacist as well. And Dr. Adams, she's my hero already. I'm in my last year of public health. So we were starting a diabetes prevention program 
And since she's doing the study, we just wanted to know what methods has she, has she had that was proven methods to increase study participants and to increase adherence. Um, I, this is I've, this is the first time I was that I've been principal investigator, but I've worked on numerous studies as co-investigator. I think to increase participation, the first thing you have to do is build trust. Yes. Uh, people are invited. People will participate when they're invited by people they know and they trust. Okay. So, um, and then some of the other co-investigators that have done um, um, uh, research in the community, they had to turn away people. And then mm -hmm. when people aren't invited by people they trust, then they don't participate. And um, so often, you know, people think about the Tuskegee um, um, experiment that happened. They were probably invited by people. And actually that was one of the, was the public health service, I think that has, uh, I did that. But, you know, and that's why it's so important as with diversity that we have black researchers, you know, people mm -hmm. that can identify with the with the with the problem. And that when they see you, they see their their mother, their sister, their uncle, their their child. And and as a, the last point I would like to make is um, that's why we're we just published our ninth. Uh, edition of the African American Health Resource Directory. If you don't have that, I can give that information to um, to you all, to Marcia. And it's a it's a guide that we uh, uh, publish. It has all it has all the African American or Black Caribbean uh, health providers, which include um, physicians. Uh, I did a big section this time on mental health providers, which were psychologists, social workers. Um, uh, marriage counselors. Um, we have the the uh, historically black um, uh, churches, the beauty shops, the barber shops. We have black uh, health education programs, and so you can um, pick that up, and it acts as a resource. And so, a lot of times, when you're doing research, you have to you need to go through the gate the gatekeepers oh, to see, know. and then you have to really be true and genuine for the community and it's really gonna help them, not just the research that you're doing. Thank but, you so much. I'll contact you afterwards, but thank you again. Okay. Oh, Marsha, we need to contact you to get a copy of that directory. Um, you can contact me and I'll, um, I'll talk with uh, Dr. Adams on how to get it to you. Okay. Okay, that yeah. okay, that's sounds- electronically. And then I'll send you the um, the uh, press release because it's lo we have the directories located throughout the um, throughout the city at different places at barbershops, beauty shops, uh, at some of the pharmacies, and so it is available. Um, so we can email it to you, but then you can um, pick it up. We have like over fourteen locations throughout the city. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, um, guys, we've pretty much run out of time. Um, I know I could stay here for another um, hour listening um, to the both doctors. Um, the, the wealth of information shared here tonight is just, un, in my opinion, unprecedented for our group and our community. And it just needs to, we, as writers, we need to share this, this information. We need to share the wealth. OK, because um, that's what we do and our community needs us to do this. So once again, my sincerest thanks and gratitude to Dr. Adams and Dr. Woods for for taking time out of their very busy schedules and coming out tonight to share this information with us so we can make our own families and our communities healthier and better. Everyone agree? Thank you yep. for inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. And with that. Marsha, 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 before you leave, yes. can you put a little information in on, on our project that we'll be working? We have a new a new company that we're working with. And can you just talk a little? Do you want to talk a little about that? I'm going to wait. Um, 
Well, we're running out of time right now. I'll mention it in 30 seconds and I'll take 30 seconds. How's that? Um, That's fine. Are we, we are also working with, um, um, what's the name of her group? I'm sorry. Um, help what me out here, Roger. Uh, um, Gwen sorry. Covington, I know her name. Gwen we're, Covington, we're working well, with Gwen Covington we're, and also um, still working with Sandra Fatme as far as being able to um, get our grant program moving. We're looking to get it moving preferably within the next 30 days. So um, everybody keep your seatbelts on and, and uh, we'll keep you abreast with the information because um, we're, we're getting ready to roll, okay? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this evening. Um, Charles, Charles Morse, um, you streamed your, uh, your, you streamed the, excuse me, streamed this meeting on your podcast i'd like to thank you and you, everyone you're welcome. who is on your side <laughs> yes. and um ladies and gentlemen it's been real tonight marsha can you hear me yes sir i can can you see me yes i can yes but we've got to go now because we're past our time if you have a question for either one of the doctors you can um, text it to me and um, I'll relay it to them and then um, you can have your answer. But we've got to respect everybody's time. Um, it's past our hour, hour and a half actually. So um, ladies and gentlemen, thank Fuck you right all now. for coming out tonight. I had a blast. I hope you did too. Love hey. you all. Have yeah, a good well, night. I had a lot to say tonight, you know, to them doctors. Like to I'm 70 years old. Hey, I've had AIDS. <laughs> I don't know. Good night. 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 I know a lot of us are kind of busy and we don't always read the paper, but we'll turn on it. We'll turn on that.